I dare you to try and read this sentence. Pause the screen if you have to. Did you get it? If English is your first language, you are probably able to figure it out pretty quickly. So why were you able to read that? And what's the point of vowels if you can still read perfectly fine without them? If texting is your main source of communication, you probably know what I mean. The reason we're able to read the sentence at all is usually attributed to psychology and our brain's super cool power to fill in the blanks. But there's another reason, and it has to do with English itself, or more specifically, the amount of information contained in the English language. But what does that mean, the amount of information contained in the English language? Like, how do you even measure that? I mean, if someone were to ask you which of these contains more information, a five-letter word or five coin flips, how would you even begin to answer? Well, Claude Shannon, a mathematician who's often referred to as the father of information theory, came up with the concept of information entropy. You may have heard the word entropy before, usually being used to describe a messy room or ice cubes melting or a demon in a box. In physics, entropy means the measure of chaos or disorder in a system. The lower the order, the higher the entropy. The way we're going to use it in this video is related, but slightly different. In information theory, entropy is the measure of information in terms of uncertainty. The higher the uncertainty, the higher the entropy. The higher the entropy, the more amount of information is in the system. This was pretty confusing to me the first time I heard it. So let's try and answer the question from before. Which has more information, a five letter word or five coin flips? Say you have a coin and it's one of those funky double head coins. A really useful way to think about how much information is in a flip is to ask, what is the least amount of yes or no questions I can ask before I know the state of my system? The more questions I have to ask, the more states it could potentially be in. So the more uncertainty there is about what it'll actually be. This coin is always gonna land on heads, right? Before you even look, you know it landed on heads. You don't need to ask any questions. There is zero uncertainty about it. So this system has zero entropy, which means it contains zero information. Now, when I first learned about this, one thing I got stuck on were the exact meanings of entropy and information. They're related, but they're not the same thing. One way I like to think about it is that entropy is the measure of uncertainty before the flip, and the information is the knowledge you have to gain after the flip. So here, there was only one possibility, so there was zero uncertainty before the flip. And you gained no knowledge by looking at the coin after the flip. So the system contained zero information. Now if we replace our funky coin with a regular fair coin, let's see what happens. Now you have two options, heads or tails. So how many yes or no questions do you need to ask to know which way it landed? Well, you could ask, is it heads? And with one yes or no answer, you'll know. So the entropy of a regular coin toss is one. Now if we have five coins, each of the coins has an entropy of one. So the amount of information in the system is five. So the amount of information contained in five coin flips is five bits. Oh yeah, bits is the unit of information. So how about a five letter word? We could just start randomly guessing words. Is it dodge? Is it juice? But that's a pretty terrible way. Remember the entropy is the least amount of questions we could possibly ask. A good approach would be to go letter by letter and ask questions which eliminate half of the possibilities. For example, the middle of the alphabet is between M and N. So we could start with, is the first letter before N? If the answer is yes, we can eliminate the lower half of the alphabet. If we divide in half again and ask, is it before G? And the answer is no, we can eliminate half again. We keep doing this until we get to the letter we want. On average, about 4.7 questions will be needed per letter. 5 times 4.7 is 23.5. So the entropy of a five-letter word is 23.5. A five-letter word contains more information than five coin flips. But does it really? I mean, you got the sentence at the beginning of the video without asking 4.7 questions per letter, I hope. This is a page from Claude Shannon's original paper on the prediction and entropy of printed English. The first lines are the original text and the second lines are the participant guesses. The dashes represent all the letters that were correctly guessed on the first try. And these letters are the ones which took one or more guesses. 
he found that 69% of the letters were guessed correctly on the first try. Here's another example which specifies exactly how many guesses each letter took. Note the large amount of ones. So what gives? Well, when we guess the five letter word, we are assuming that English was a totally random sequence of letters, which as my third grade teacher kept reminding me, it isn't. There's grammar, spelling, patterns, things that make it less random. Like the fact that Q is always followed by a U, or that E appears a lot more than Z. In information theory, these are called redundancies. My friend Mark, who runs a channel all about words, knows a lot of cool stuff about redundancies. And we're lucky enough to have him share some of that stuff with us today. Thanks, Jade. Yes, you're certainly right that English doesn't have the most efficient spelling system, and people complain about it all the time. But the history of English spelling is moving from higher entropy to lower entropy, and paradoxically, some of the confusion is the result of that shift. More and more patterns and information have been added to make English easier to read. In ancient Latin and Greek, for instance, there were no spaces between words, no capital letters. Well, actually only capital letters. Lowercase wasn't invented until the Middle Ages. And no punctuation. How easy do you find this to read? Actually, if we go right back to the beginning of the alphabet used by various Semitic peoples, such as the Phoenicians, there weren't even any vowels, like in the sentence Jade started this video with. No problem, right? Well, maybe a bit of a problem. And how about this? Because for a long time, there wasn't any rule about which direction people wrote. Sometimes words went right to left, sometimes left to right, and sometimes back and forth in the same document. But the thing is, English doesn't work as well without vowels as Phoenician did, and that's part of the story of why languages such as Ancient Greek, Latin, and English have added so many extras to the writing system. And there are elements of English spelling, such as Q always being followed by a U, or H only following certain consonants, or having a silent E on the end of many words, or double letters, that help us read a word even if we can only see some of the letters. This type of redundancy, where there's more information on the page than is strictly necessary for comprehension, can make English spelling seem complicated. So Jade, why does English have so many redundancies? Redundancies are really useful for keeping a message safe from interference or noise. Like when you're in bad reception! In situations where information can be lost, which, let's face it, is a lot of the time, so what's cool is that we can tailor the interplay between entropy and redundancy depending on the message we want to send. When texting a friend, it's cool to have a bit of uncertainty because it doesn't matter too much if there's a miscommunication. So here you can send a quicker message with less information. But with your boss, you're probably better off taking the time to send a clear-cut email, spelling everything out. Because if there's any miscommunication, well, there can be big consequences. Basically, if you want to send a cheaper, faster, more efficient message, you'd send a message with higher entropy. If you need to send a message where it's super important all of the information gets across, you'd send a message with more redundancies. And you can always mix and match. In sending messages to outer space, it's extremely expensive and super vulnerable to information loss. But you really don't want an angry alien getting the wrong idea either. Oh, and in case you were wondering, Claude Shannon actually did calculate the entropy of English to be 2.62 bits per letter on average. So that's a bit about the math of the English language. If you wanted to know more about the history and how we got all these wacky rules in the first place, Mark's got you covered. Thanks, Jade. We're telling the story of English spelling, from ancient Egypt and Rome to inventive Anglo-Saxon writers, Vikings and snooty French scribes, to a king's court and an unsatisfying grocery shopping experience. And along the way, we'll explain why spelling is so magical, the etymology of diphtheria, and the real story behind that troublesome G in GIF, or GIF, whatever. Thanks for watching guys, I can't wait to find out if it's pronounced GIF or GIF. So head over to the video we did on Mark's channel, Alliterative. There's some really interesting stuff over there. I'm back! That was super abrupt, right? Yeah, I didn't really know how to segue into that. But anyway, the point is that I'm back. I'm back from film course, I'm back from VidCon, and now I'm here and ready to make videos again. I really missed it, I really missed you guys. Um, so yeah, be seeing you shortly. Bye!